Hey everyone, so today we're gonna to take a quick dive and do a little tutorial on a new-ish database, but probably pretty new to most of you in the geospatial world called DuckDB. So DuckDB has been around for a few years now and in the broader data and analytics space, it's actually been making quite a splash for a few different reasons. First, that DuckDB runs right on your computer. Now, this goes a little bit against the tide of everything moving into the cloud and using distributed processing and, and other tools like data warehouses to actually process your data. So the central idea behind DuckDB is that our computers have increasingly got more and more powerful. We have more CPU and can process a lot more data right on our actual computer. At the same time, we find ourselves moving things into the cloud and spending a ton of time actually setting up the infrastructure to process our data. So one of the creators of DuckDB, Hannes Mohais and others, created this tool with these ideas in mind at CWI Amsterdam, which was coincidentally enough the same place where Python was thought of. Now if we take a look at the DuckDB homepage, you can see some of the core principles and tenets of the project here. The first, that's completely simple. There's no dependencies, there's the APIs for different languages that you might use like Python or R, and it processes everything in process. And basically that means it's very, very fast. We create multiple different file types like CSV, Parquet, and as we'll find out in a minute, new support for geospatial file types, and it's completely written in native SQL. It's incredibly fast, which we'll see in a minute. It has this vectorized query engine, and it allows you to do all these processes for analytical tools compared to other databases that are transaction based. This means is that aggregations and all these different queries that you might run, run much, much faster on DuckDB. Finally, it's free and open source. Anyone can download it and start using it. The other part is it has lots of different extensions and we'll use three different extensions today. One is the HTTPFS, which allows us to grab different files and read those files directly from web-based sources. We'll also look at the spatial extension, which just launched full support within DuckDB. And then finally, the H3 extension, which allows us to use the spatial index H3 across different geospatial data. Type. So the other thing that you might have heard is that this is a what we call OLAP database or online analytical processing. This differs from an OLTP or online transactional processing database, which is really optimized to handle things like inserts of data coming from different applications writing data to that database. An online analytical database really focuses in on how you actually analyze that data, doing things like aggregations or joins. So it's really optimized to do just that. I think that's why DuckDB is getting very popular. All these different reasons, it's free, I can run it on my machine and I can process crazy amounts of data without actually connecting to any other service. So it's still early days for the spatial components of DuckDB. They're still being developed and actively growing quite a bit. But strangely enough, while I was coming up with this video, the spatial extension is now fully supported so you don't have to build and load the local extension. You can actually just download that and use it right from DuckDB itself. All right, so let's jump in. I'm gonna switch over to my computer. We can take a look at some different use cases and a few resources that'll help you get started. All right, so we switched over to my computer here and we're gonna take a look at first getting set up and installed with DuckDB. So there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, we're actually gonna review two in this video. The first is through the command line and the second is through Python. But as you can see, there's a lot of different APIs that you can use here. You can use R, Java, Node, Julia, C, C++, and ODBC connectors as well. So uh, the first is with command line. Now I use Mac OS, so what I'm gonna do is actually use brew install DuckDB uh, to do that through my command line. Otherwise, you can use different options through Windows or Linux if you use the operating system. Now within Python, it's actually pretty simple. You can just use pip install DuckDB, and then you're all set up and running from there. Um, we'll take a look at how that works in a minute, and then how to actually set up a database and use those between the two different tools from there. So I've actually already installed DuckDB, but if you were doing this for the first time, we can actually zoom in here a little bit to make this a bit bigger. And if you have Homebrew installed, you should be ready to go. If not, uh, you can go ahead and do that as well, but I just have to go brew install DuckDB. Uh, it's probably gonna tell me that I've already installed this, which is no big deal. So we'll go ahead and I'll see, hey, you've already done that and we're ready to go. So uh, as you can see here, we have version 0.7.1, which is the one I'm using as of this video. Now, one resource that I used when I was getting started was this video. It's a beginner explainer for DuckDB. It's from Mother Duck, which is a tool that's building a serverless version of DuckDB. So there's actually a section of this video that shows you how to set this up with your favorite code editor. In this case, I'm gonna use VS Code. Uh, it's a really simple setup, so that allows you just to keep it as simple as possible, nothing too crazy going on. So that's actually the workflow that we're gonna use to set this up. So I've set up a folder where I'm gonna keep all my different data, open that in VS Code. I've called it Quack to stay on brand here with DuckDB. And then there's one little key binding I can add in. And now you have to navigate here and find the key bindings. 
and it's this little JSON file here. And all you have to do is add this shift enter and then that will actually run something in the terminal down here. So I have my data, I have my terminal, and I have my code that I can write here. So once that's set up, I can actually just open a new file and we can write start writing some SQL. So first we're going to set up our database. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call DuckDB. I've already set up a database here so I can create that with Matt dot db and that's my database that i've been using and then i want to add the unsigned flag since i'm going to be using some extensions that are in fact not a part of the ecosystem that are sort of not approved yet but are totally safe and easy to use so once i've done that i'm actually ready to go here and just to make sure everything's working i just write a quick sql query make sure you add your semicolon here at the end and we can go ahead and once that line's selected i just hit shift enter and you can see here that everything's working great. So let's go ahead and save this file and we'll just call this our new, so let's call this video.sql and we'll be ready to go. All right, so now that we have our DuckDB instance set up, we need to install our two spatial extensions. So the first one we want to install is DuckDB Spatial, which is the spatial extension for DuckDB that's maintained by DuckDB Labs, a group that created DuckDB. The second is our extension for H3, uh, which is actually built by the one of the creators of H3 that is right here. So literally, as I was in the middle of putting this video together, a uh, few days ago, they actually announced that the spatial extension uh, for DuckDB is actually going to be supported natively by DuckDB, which means that it's going to be a simple install. You can just call it uh, when you have the proper version of DuckDB installed with install duck uh, install spatial and then uh, actually load spatial. But I have the older version, so I'm just going to continue to use that. You can read all about that here, which this uh, blog post is actually really uh, helpful to understand what is going into uh, the spatial extension and how it works. Um, and you Gotta love the title, Post Geese. Um, there's a lot of different duck slash bird references here. So a um, little homage to PostGIS there. The other extension we're looking at is H3. This one you do have to build the bindings for, uh, which can be tricky depending on if you've used this or not. If uh, you're on a Mac, you're gonna need Xcode installed so you can use the make commands. Effectively, all you wanna do here is clone this repo. So git clone from here. Uh, once you're in there, you're going to navigate into that file and do git sub module update, make duckdb release and then you can build it from there. So we can actually take a look at the commands to do that. So I've actually already done that before. So if you needed to run that command, you can actually go over here. You can copy your GitHub clone command here. I'll navigate back into my main folder here. You would just clone that repo, go into that repo. And then what you can do is actually take those commands that are in the readme file here. So you're just gonna go get some module update and in it, that's going to get everything running up here to get these submodules for DuckDB and H3. So that'll take a minute to install there. As that's running, I'm going to grab this command to actually make or build this extension. Now to do this, if you're on a Mac, you're gonna need Xcode installed. Linux and Windows will be a little bit different, but since I'm on a Mac, we'll just go with this. I've already installed and got Xcode set up, so I should be able to run this command just fine, and that's gonna actually run this out. But since I've done this already, I don't need to do this again. I'm just going to close this out, and we'll proceed forward. Now you notice when I started my DuckDB service here, um, I used this mat.db. Now you can create any database here. You can call it new, you can call it DuckDB. You can call it DB, whatever you want. Um, if you don't have one, that will create one already for you. Since I have some data in there, I'm just gonna use my current one that I'm already running and get that set back up again. So the other option, if you wanna get the spatial version, you don't actually have to build this. You can go into actions here on the main GitHub page and then pick the distribution you want. I'll choose Mac OS. I'll click here to the most recent version. And then you can actually download the binaries here. And then once that downloads, you'll be get access to the actual extension. I just copy that and put that into my folder here, which you can see here. So the first step is to actually get these loaded in. So the first step is I'm going to load in spatial. And we'll do that just by running the command first install. And I'm just gonna copy the path here. Put that in single quotes and make sure I use my semicolon. That's gonna install that. And then next step is, oops, don't want that there. And we'll actually just run the command to load that in. So that's all loaded now. We should be able to now uh, create a point with our query. So we'll just go select st point. And we'll look at all the commands in a minute, but just for simplicity's sake, oops. Let's see what we got here. And yes, we have a point. It is a valid geometry and there we go. 
So that is all set up. The next step is that I actually want to load in the H3 library here. So we'll go load H3. So to get the location of the H3 extension, I can open this up. You want to go into this build folder, build release, and then you'll see it right here. I can once again, just copy path and I'll run those same commands here. So I'll go paste this and we'll do the same here. So let's load that in and then load here. So this is one of the commands that we brought as a testing one within the GitHub repo itself. And this looks right. We actually can cast this to the parent at the cell level one. So everything seems to be working just fine. All right, so the first step is that I'm gonna load in some data from the New York City Open Data Portal. This is 311 service request. This goes all the way back to 2010 and there's uh, quite a bit of data in here. If you wanna pull the whole data set, there's 32 million or almost 33 million different rows here. Um, and you can see there's some different information about the different requests. There's information about the agency, the description, where it was located. And of course, for our purpose, is we have two different coordinate systems. There's the state planner system, which we're not gonna use, and then a regular latitude and longitude. So I actually have some of this data already loaded in. This is actually as a GeoJSON file. It's about 3 million rows, so I think it's a few years worth of data. So we're not working with the whole data set yet, but certainly if you want to, you can pull the whole thing and play around with a much, much larger data sample. So we're gonna uh, basically create a new table here, and we're gonna use a command called stread. We'll take a look at what that does in a minute. So we'll go create or replace table NYC 311 as, and what we'll do is we'll go select we're gonna go all the columns we want, and then we're gonna actually create uh, a new geometry that's proper from the uh, WKB geometry, which is what is imported here. So if we go back to our DuckDB spatial here, we can see in the readme some documentation here. So we have this function that is called stread. Let's just go ahead and find that. And we can take a look at an example here. So we can actually see how we can create a table from a specific data type or from the ST read, uh, which is what we're gonna use here. So we'll go with ST read. And let's continue to build our query over here. And what we wanna do is actually pull in that specific file. So I'll go here copy path, and then drop that here. So we're ready to read our GeoJSON in. Now there's two other columns that I wanna add in. First is the actual geometry. When I import this, this will be pulling in a well-known binary geometry. I wanna turn that into an actual uh, geometry within the database itself. So there's a function for that here. We'll scroll down to functions and constructors. So we'll scroll down here. We can see there's geom from WKB go back over here and then uh, it actually pulls in a column called WKB underscore geometry. We'll cast that as geom and then we also are going to create the H3 cell from that as well. So I'm just going to go over here and copy this really quickly so you can kind of see what this looks like. Um, I'm going to use a function H3 lat long to cell. So I have my latitude and longitude. These import as strings, uh, at least in my data set from the GeoJSON. And then what I'll do is I'll just cast those to the real or that's basically a decimal place. I'm gonna go down to the 10th level or the uh, cell 10 level and then as H3. So that's what that's gonna do. Now there's one other piece here is that um, to import this properly, there's a bunch of uh, latitude and longitudes that have no data in there. So just to exclude those, we're gonna go where latitude does not equal basically blank, so that's what you know. So we have to join this all together on one line, so let's just do that quickly here. And I know there is an extension to make that a little bit faster, but uh, for now we have, we can see all this query on the line. So let's go ahead and hit enter here. This is going to import that data as a new table. All right, so it looks like our data has imported. Um, we can see here that everything looks set up. So one other great feature I like about DuckDB is that you don't have to necessarily hit select star for everything. So in this case, I can just get hit from our new table name, which is uh, NYC311. And then let's just do a quick limit of 10. And we can go ahead and run that. We can see that yes, our data is here. We have a geometry and everything we want. Now you can't see all of the different columns, but they already thought of that. So we'll just hit describe. I'll go NYC311. And if I could spell it right, that would help. So there we go, we can see all of the different column names, the data types, everything that we want here that is in our data set. So that's another really nice feature that I like about DuckDB. So we can also take a look at all the different drivers that we have. We can actually see all of the different formats of data that you can import with this stread function. Um, so lots of different data types here. You can read just about anything, shapefiles, 
GML, CSVs, CAD files, whatever you want. So there's a really, a really complete set of drivers for different geospatial data types, which is great too. Okay, now we're gonna actually add a data layer uh, that is New York City neighborhoods that we can do some spatial joins and other tests with here. So there is a data set on the New York City open data portal, but I don't particularly like it because it's called neighborhood tabulation areas and actually doesn't really reflect the nuances of New York City neighborhoods or how people actually understand neighborhoods. So this is actually some data that uh, Hodges Ward Elliott, uh, a real estate company, actually put out. Uh, thank you, Tim Keeley, actually put this together. Um, I didn't notice that until now, so thank you, Tim. Uh, but this is actually some real neighborhoods that I think people start to understand and um, actually use. So what's great here is that you can actually see there is a GeoJSON here. You can see the different neighborhoods and areas that have been defined. And then if you go to the raw code here, we actually get the raw GeoJSON. Now, another great feature about DuckDB is that we can actually install a driver to read remote files. So we'll just go install HTTPFS. We've done that. And then we do the same thing. Load HTTPFS. And now we're all set up. So we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to create our table. I'm just going to copy the command. Uh, in the interest of time. And as you can see here, we're actually ST reading from this remote file that we had before. So let's go ahead and add this in. I had to get rid of the old version of the table I had before so we can demonstrate and now it's already there. So what's great here is once again, I'm gonna just go from NYC neighborhoods limit 10. And you can see here, we already have our data in there. So it's also super easy to export data out of DuckDB into a different format. So DuckDB provides the copy command. And what I can do here is I can select the neighborhood, geom, and we'll just limit it to 10 different ones for now to demonstrate this. We're gonna pass it to this GeoJSON. And then you have this different, you can have a format GDAL, the driver GeoJSON, layer create options. And then if you want to write a bounding box, you can do, choose to do so and things like that. So back here, you have some different formats here that you can use. This is a quick example of writing out to GeoJSON. Um, sequential data here. So um, it's really easy to just create this out. And well, all those drivers that we just saw, you can use those. If you want to write a shape file or you want to write something else, you can certainly do that too. All right, so what we'll do is this will pass in and we'll create uh, a file called GeoJSON. I'm actually going to put that into our data folder and we'll go ahead and run that out. And now you can see here, if I go into our data folder, we have this joined uh, GeoJSON. Now, I, was, I actually added an extension. There's a maps extension. I believe it's from Microsoft here. Um, once you add it in, you can actually view the map. So if you go over here to extensions, uh, if you search for the GeoData Viewer, this is the one that I've been using, just install that and then just view this in the map. Uh, what I love about this is it actually just opens up a fresh Kepler GL map and you can do anything to just quickly style this here. So it's really easy to write a query, write it out to data, and then quickly see it on the map. There's really not a whole lot that you actually have to do to make this all work. So it's all there and, and ready for you to use. What I also like about this, if you actually want to just save this as an HTML file or the data or the map here, you can just export this out and host this or do whatever you want with it. It's really easy just to query, create map, and go from there. It's pretty simple, but uh, it works. All right, so there's another feature that I really want to call out here that I, I think is probably one of the most interesting things uh, about this extension is that currently that geometry data type that you saw is, is the same simple features or SQL MM model that has been pretty much used for years. It's the OGC uh, simple features access and SQL MM standards, right? So this is the same thing we use in PostGIS or Spatialite or uh, pretty much <coughs> any database or data warehouse that you might use. So since those standards have been implemented, there hasn't been a lot of change to those base geometry types or the simple features. Now, the this paragraph right here is I think actually pretty important, is that they're providing uh, what they call a non-standard specialized columnar DuckDB native geometry type. And what that means is just a native data type to DuckDB that optimizes and uses what DuckDB is really uh, you know, fast for. So that has points, polygons, uh, lines, and then this uh, box 2D structure. This is two-dimensional two data only, so it'll work great with vectors or any sort of geospatial data that you have. And ultimately, what we should see is that this per will perform faster. Now, it's only in early stages in terms of what's implemented. So we can actually go back here and see where that is implemented. If we scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see anything with this duck in it is uh, using that native point 2D or line string or polygon data type. So 
we can actually cast to that data type, which is what you'll do. And there's only a handful of functions that actually use it. There's centroids. Uh, we have a lot of point data. But this one's ST distance is one we can actually check and compare. Does the native type or the point 2D, polygon 2D, all these different data types run faster than the native geometry types? So let's go ahead and give it a shot. So what I'll do, uh, we'll just do call it here, point 2, 2D testing. And what we'll do is we'll actually alter our table and add a new column. So we'll go alter table NYC 311 add column point and we'll use the point 2D data type. So let's run that. We have our new column and we'll just update that. So update set point and we'll just cast that geom column to point to oops underscore 2d and now we should have that there so what we can do um, let's just quickly see how many rows we ultimately have so let's do a select so ultimately this is a uh, just a few just about a hundred thousand rows over three million um, so that's how much data we're working with and we're going to kind of test to see how fast a st distance function uh, on this many rows will work within DuckDB. so let's go ahead and give that a shot so first we'll test our geometry type so what I'm, all i'm doing here is i'm going to return a table that gets the distance between the geometry and creating a point uh, at this point is just the uh, latitude and longitude for the empire state building so let's go ahead and give that a shot all right, so we can see that that was very fast. There's actually a timer that we can implement with the dot timer on. There we go. And let's give that a shot again. All right, so you can see that took uh, 0.66-ish seconds, 6 by 8 seconds. So a little over half a second to run on the geometry type. All right, let's give that a shot with the point function. Copying this from some earlier work that I did. And we're going to do ST distance with the point data type this time, and then we're going to translate the ST point into point TD, and we'll see how fast that takes. And that was a lot faster. So this went down to 0.125 seconds. Um, that's pretty fast. In other tests, I've actually had this run even a little bit faster than that. Um, I've gotten this down, yeah, they're 0 0.19, 0 0.019 seconds. So Needless to say, this is a lot faster. I've gotten between 10 to 30 times performance boost just from that. So just for example, I ran the same query here, but just with the single point, this is a local post uh, GIS instance I have running in a Docker container and that doesn't have necessarily a ton of CPU thrown at it. Uh, but this table has a spatial index applied to it and some other things. Uh, I do have to create that point on the fly. So there may be some efficiencies gained there, but ultimately, I mean, this is one minute and 20 seconds um, to run this query just from the pure geometry compared to about half a second uh, within DuckDB and then far less compared to like a tenth of a second or, or even less, uh, you know, using the new native uh, DuckDB data type. So you can see why I'm particularly excited about the new geospatial data types that are going to be within the DuckDB spatial extension. I guess the next question to ask is what happens if we scale this up a lot? This is three million rows and just for reference that was calculating the distances. Um, on 3 million rows in 0 0.019 seconds, which is incredibly fast, right? And this is just the power of how fast this is. So let's try this out. Um, we're going to actually grab, first of all, 10 random rows from our original data set. So we're going to do select the uh, unique key and then the key from this query here, measure the distance between the two, and uh, actually figure out what that is. So this should, in turn, uh, you know, multiply the values times 10. So you know, basically 31 million different rows. So let's see how fast this takes. And that took half a second and 31 million rows. I just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> that half a second, 31 million rows is pretty crazy. So I, I think that's really unique. I mean, we can even go up to here and we'll have 300 million rows. And that will take you know a handful of seconds here and we'll see how long that takes. Yeah, four seconds to do all of that distance calculation. So I think that kind of speaks to how powerful DuckDB can really be, not just on normal data, but geospatial data. And this new data type, I think, is going to be really impactful for doing really large scale analytics. And just remember, I'm running this on my computer. This isn't anything fancy. Um, I'll show you here. This is my uh, 16 gigs. I have an M1 chip, and I think this is yeah, it's from 2020. So this computer is three years old. All right, so I mean, it's it's it is a you know it's fast. I'm not saying it's not fast, but man, that's a crazy amount of data that we're working with. 
So the last thing I want to do is actually run uh, through an H3 use case. So we installed that library at the beginning, um, and we'll just do some simple aggregations there. So, so if you remember from the beginning, we actually uh, have that. We'll just check our data again, describe our table here, and we should have that H3 right here, OK? So what we did to actually achieve that, if we scroll back up here, you can see when we created the table, we did this function H3 lat long to sell using our latitude and longitude. Now, normally what you want to do to make that readable in something like uh, Kepler is turn that, and we can just see it is the integer version of the H3 cells. Let's go limit 10. And you can see here we have this uh, integer, right? Now, this is still, like I said, early days. The function that I was trying to use to turn that into the hex you know, string ID, which is uh, what you would normally see with an H3, it did not work. I think there's some binary cross issues, and I, I logged an issue in the GitHub repo, so hopefully hear back on that soon. But what I love about this is that not only can I just run everything here, but I can also run this in a different language. So let's just pop over here. I actually opened a notebook and started writing this. So all I have to do is import DuckDB. I installed this already, um, imported that here, and I'm just connecting to that same database. So let's just run this again. You see I'm connected here. And you can see I can actually just do two things here. I'm going to run this query, right? select count the H3 cell, and then group it by that count. And I'm actually going to turn this into a data frame. Just by adding that .df function, I'm turning that into a data frame. So I've installed my H3 library here. And then on this, I'm just going to basically turn the H3 string using H3 and apply the function from the Python library. right? So what I have now is I just have to do that. And now I have this wonderful data set here. I'm just going to pull that in to a CSV here. Now that I have this CSV, I can actually just move back to where we were here. Um, it's in a different folder, so I'll just cop. I actually pull that in here. You can see here I have my CSV string, and then let's just add that to our map. And here it is, our aggregated as H3 strings NYC 311 calls. So this is this is really so. Let's say I wanted to just look at where there were incidents of noise, right? So I can just limit this complaint type. We'll go like, and we'll filter that to noise. Here I have to escape this properly, so let me just do that now. So that's all I have to do. Um, we can just create our new data frame here, and we'll apply the same things we have there. And now we have all of that in noise. Uh, we'll just add a new CSV. And done, we have a new CSV that we can then pull back in here. So small mistake, uh, I just had to fix the location I want to write that file to. We should see that here now. And then once again, boom, open a map. And here is a map, but this time just with our noise complaints. Now you can write as many of these files as you want, right? I can do this for you know different dates. I can do this for specific things, then different incident types. I mean, the the options are really just limitless here, which I think is the really cool part. So before we go, there's two other resources I'd like to call out. Uh, Mark here has done some great work writing on Geospatial DuckDB. His blog, tech.marksblog with two gs.com, um, it talks about the DuckDB spatial extension and Geospatial DuckDB. Um, he wrote this on April 9th. I'm on May 2nd now, and it's already uh, implemented as a native component within there. Uh, so you can see how fast things are moving here, uh, which is really great to see. So check this out. There's some different, uh, I, I used a lot of his tutorials here to get up and running. So thank you, Mark, for that. So also check out this post. This is on Mother Duck, which is uh, Amy to be sort of a serverless version of uh, DuckDB. Uh, this is big data is dead and kind of explains why, um, you know, I think DuckDB can have a major impact in the space and in the sort of modern data stack that we see today. Um, so check this out. I think it does a really good job of explaining why these things are out there. And um, yeah, give it a read. I think it's uh, really worth uh, worthwhile. Okay, so that's it. That's everything I put together today for our dive into geospatial DuckDB. Um, I'm really excited about this. Just look at the amount of data we were able to process. It was the simplest setup I think you could possibly go through. Uh, once these ecosystem and, and things expand for geospatial, um, more functions are implemented within that native data type. I mean, the possibilities are really limitless here. Um, and I think it's going to be really cool to see how this grows and expands over time. But it's ready to use it. You can start using this and downloading and playing around with it today. It's great for data processing. Um, it, it simplifies things. And everything's in SQL. So you can just have one standard language to do this and the power here is just crazy the amount of data that you're able to use and there's so much more I didn't even touch on you can use partition files you can use uh, parquet files um, you know there's all these different things you can pull data from cloud data storage you know there's just a lot so uh, take some time uh, explore it uh, I'd love to hear how you're using it well but hope this gave you a quick introduction to this tool that I think is going to be really really great